Excellent. All right, so uh, folks are still joining, but we're going to get underway. Uh, good afternoon, good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. My name is Stephanie Michaud and I'm President and CEO of BioCanRx. Uh, before we begin, we want to acknowledge that BioCanRx is situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. We acknowledge and respect our traditional hosts and thank them for allowing us to operate on this land. It is also important to recognize that we are gathering virtually, and I encourage all of those joining us to learn more about the traditional land they are going on by going to whose.land website. We are very pleased that you could join us today for BioCanRx's virtual public forum, an event that takes place annually to coincide and alongside our Summit for Cancer Immunotherapy, which is our scientific conference. This year's topic for the public forum is understanding cancer immunotherapy clinical trials in Canada. Are they needed now more than ever? We wish to thank our sponsor, Merck, for sponsoring today's session. Before we begin, and I introduce the moderators for this event, a few housekeeping notes. If you'd like to ask a question, please add it to the chat box. You will find this at the bottom of your screen. The forum today will be recorded and we will be posting it to the BioCanRx YouTube channel. We will also share a link in the chat box to a survey we hope you'll fill out after the forum and a link will also be emailed to you. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our moderators for this event, Louise Binder and Dr. Calvin Chan. Louise Binder is a lawyer and a health advocate who has been involved in informing the development of health policy and systemic treatment access practices from the patient perspective since the early 90s, subsequent to her own HIV diagnosis. She co-founded the Canadian Treatment Action Council in 1996. Louise began similar work in the cancer area and is presently a health policy consultant with the Save Your Skin Foundation. She has been recognized by many organizations for her work, including receiving an honorary doctorate of laws from her alma mater, Queen's Law School, the Order of Ontario from the province of Ontario, and not one, but two Queen Elizabeth II medals. Dr. Calvin Chan is a medical oncologist at the Sunnybrook Odette Cancer Center, an associate professor at the University of Toronto, and an associate scientist at the Sunnybrook Research Institute. He specializes in GI oncology and head and neck oncology. He is also a health economist, clinical epidemiologist, a biostatistician, and Dr. Chan's research interests include health service research, health technology assessment, also known as HTA, meta-analysis, including network meta-analysis, cost-effective analyses, and statistical methods research in health economics. He is co-director at the Canadian Centre for Applied Research in Cancer Control that is funded by the Canadian Cancer Society. He is a member of multiple provincial and national committees related to cancer drug assessment and recommendations and is the clinical lead for the provincial drug reimbursement programs at Cancer Care Ontario. Both of these individuals are also engaged with the BioCanRx network, Louise Binder as chair of our Cancer Stakeholder Alliance and Dr. Calvin Chen is on the research management committee of BioCanRx. Over to you, Louise and Calvin. Thanks, Stephanie, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have assembled a great panel, uh, and they will be sharing their thoughts about immunotherapy clinical trials with us. Some of the themes that will be covered today include what's the value of immunotherapy clinical trials in making effective therapies available to patients? How do patients access cancer clinical trials? How have the clinical trials um, overall paradigm pivoted during the COVID pandemic and what are the impacts for future care? And also how you can have a conversation with your physicians about immunotherapy clinical trials. So we'll first start with some opening remarks from the panelists. And then after that, we'll go to a Q&A session where you have an opportunity to ask questions to all our panelists. And so please allow me to introduce our three panelists for today. First, we have Dr. Lacey Petrie, who is a medical oncologist from Sudbury, Ontario, 
and she specializes in breast and lung cancers. She's a strong advocate for equitable access for cancer clinical trials, regardless of where you live. She's currently the lead for clinical trials at her center and is a local principal investigator on several clinical trials involving breast cancer, lung cancer, and head and neck cancer. She's also an assistant professor at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, and she's the lead of the Ontario Health Cancer Care Ontario Systemic Therapy for the Northeastern Ontario region. And next, we have Dr. John Bell, who is an internationally well-known thought leader in oncolytic virus research and development. He's a senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital and a professor of medicine and biochemistry, microbiology, and immunology at the University of Ottawa. He's well known to us as the scientific director of BioCanRx, Canada's immunotherapy network and a network of centers of excellence. Among all of John's achievement, which is a very long list, very importantly, John was the winner of the inaugural Public and Patient Engagement Award from the, from the European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy in uh, 2019, which shows his strong dedication to patient involvement and engagement in research. And last but not least, um, our third panelist is our patient partner, David McMullen. And this is where I will turn it over to Louise, my partner, co-moderator, to introduce David. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, it is my really sincerely great pleasure to introduce my colleague, and I'd like to say my friend, David <laughs> McMullen, a patient, a patient advocate, and a clinical trial participant. David's been a professional engineer for over 37 years, working in various management positions for Ontario Power Generation. In 2012, he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, an incurable hematologic cancer. He's been treated with two stem cell transplants and numerous other treatments, including participation in a phase one clinical trial, which of course will be the main subject of our chat with him today. He is actively involved in numerous organizations representing patients and particularly Myeloma Canada, a national patient-based organization uh, and a charity, and the National Myeloma Canada Patient Advisory Council, which he founded. I could go on and on about David's amazing accomplishments for cancer patients without ever doing him justice. And so instead, let's turn it over to him. You're in for a great treat. So David, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and your experience with cancer. <laughs> Wow, Louise. Well, first, thank you so much for that uh, tremendously kind introduction. And thank you to BioCan RX for including me in, in this panel. Uh, it's certainly something very meaningful to me. Um, one other experience that has uh, benefited me in, in this area is that for several years now, I've been a patient representative in the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, uh, which plans and conducts cancer-related clinical trials. I'm also a patient representative in a national organization called CADIF, uh, which makes recommendations to provinces about funding treatments based partly on results of clinical trials. Um, but even more importantly, I have tremendous gratitude uh, that I have lived for as long as I have, you know, with this incurable disease, and that I am as healthy as I am. And that's largely due to the life-saving treatments I have received. Uh, which are all a result of research and, of course, the loving care of my dear wife, Erica. Uh, however, these treatments uh, were no longer uh, working well um, uh, recently. So earlier this year, my doctor and I started conversations about possible clinical trials. Uh, and uh, this summer, I started a, a trial using an immunotherapy called a bispecific antibody. The results so far are encouraging. Thank you, David. Um, I wanted to talk uh, more in more detail with you about clinical trials. Uh, we hear so much about them, but uh, often they're not really very well understood. Um, so 
um, just from a lay perspective, from what I understand, just to, to, to situate us on clinical trials, um, clinical trials take place after treatment has been tested in a test tube and sometimes in animals, including often mice. Um, and uh, if it's found to be safe at that point, it enters uh, a phase one trial in people, uh, usually a small one, um, to test the safety of it in healthy volunteers. And I want to start by thanking all the healthy volunteers who over the years have been good enough to uh, volunteer for these, for, for these trials. Um, then, if it seems to be safe in them, it moves into phase two, where it goes into patients, and that's to look at both safety in patients and also effectiveness in them. And if it, it's successful at that point, my understanding is that it goes into a third phase with much broader patient engagement um, to look at the safety and effectiveness. So um, no one entering a trial, as I understand it, uh, knows what the outcome will be. How can we? Um, and in some types of trials, uh, they don't even know if they're getting the actual drug or if they're getting something called a placebo. That is a product that has no treatment in it whatsoever. So, and, they, and they're compared. So I, I also want to say thank you to all the courageous trial participants uh, throughout the years who have helped science move forward and also have saved so many lives and enhanced quality of life for so many people, including you, David. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about your uh, trial experience, why you entered a trial, and, and how you got help in making your decision about doing that. Well, sure. Um, in my case, um, because of my previous volunteer work, I was quite knowledgeable about clinical trials prior to having the, the conversation about me participating with my doctor. But most patients, Louise, uh, are not so knowledgeable. Um, and um, in my case, my conversation went well, not just because I was informed, but because my uh, doctor was a very strong proponent of clinical trials, more so than many oncologists. Um, and you know, for this reason, I would encourage patients uh, to not be shy uh, about respectfully asking their healthcare team uh, about clinical trials as possible options for now and for some time in the future. Um, and again, this is not just to benefit uh, ourselves individually as patients, but it's also meaningful um, uh, to uh, contribute uh, to the future of treatments uh, for um, fellow patients. Um, in my case, it'd be fellow myeloma patients. Um, the other thing, if, if, if your doctor knows that you are interested and open to the possibility of a clinical trial, then your doctor is more likely to take the time to discuss it. You know, God love our, our doctors. You know, they, they are tremendous professionals and human beings, but they're, they all have you know, a tremendous amount in their plates. Um, so many of them really don't want to spend a lot of time talking about trials with a patient who doesn't, isn't open to the concept. So if you demonstrate you're open to the concept, then your doctor is more likely going to uh, take, take the time. Um, so thank you, Louise. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about your, um, your perspective about the importance of clinical trials. Uh, sure. Well, um, and, and there are, well, there's a number of perspectives. Uh, again, um, you know, from a very selfish point of view, um, uh, it offers uh, treatments that would otherwise not be available, such as the one I'm, I'm on now, which uh, so far is in, encouraging. Um, but uh, again, it, it is immensely gratifying um, and meaningful. Uh, to have a part in making lives better for my fellow, in my case, myeloma patients um, in, in the future. Uh, there are some other um, advantages that I think we'll talk about later too. So I guess the flip side is 
um, what would you say are some of the challenges and uh, barriers that people face to access, accessing trials? Yes, um, well, um, one of the first things that comes to mind is it does take time um, and uh, there's some inconvenience as the inconvenience factor of participating in, in clinical trials. Um, uh, there could be you know, some costs, um, some out-of-pocket costs, and, and if you're working, time off work. Um, but uh, I believe that uh, usually the benefits of the trials uh, or taking part in a trial, you know, outweighs you know, that the time involved and the inconvenience uh, involved. Um, there are other challenges um, uh, for some patients, or, well, I'd say most patients who don't live in a big city or close to a major hospital, a major uh, cancer treatment center. Um, it might mean that, uh, you know, trials may not be, you know, as readily available. Uh, I think, I know there are some measures uh, that uh, some doctors are implementing now uh, to address that. Um, and uh, I believe Dr. Petrie will, will talk more about that. But um, yes, there, there can be a barrier if you live in a remote location um, or even in a smaller center, uh, smaller, um, an area with, with a smaller hospital. Um, uh, there may not be as immediately available um, uh, clinical trials that, as would be the case in, in a major center. Uh, so it, in situations like this, it's even more important, in my view, for patients to become aware of what might be out there uh, for clinical trials that might benefit themselves, become an, more knowledgeable uh, about clinical trials, um, and to be able to you know, politely and respectfully advocate for themselves. And I guess uh, those are definitely individual challenges and barriers. And I guess there are also some population uh, challenges and barriers in terms of people who don't have uh, access to uh, what we've called social determinants of mm -hmm. health and also they're called health inequities. Um, mm -hmm. Could you speak about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, in my observation so far, um, people who uh, are well-educated, you know, perhaps on average people who are, um, you know, more affluent um, uh, and, uh, you know, even, you know, people like the, um, you know, people of color, Indigenous people um, and the like, you know, they might have less access where people who are more educated uh, tend to advocate for themselves better. They tend to be more articulate. Um, so with that in mind, um, I believe that we need to be more accommodating to um, uh, people who you know, um, lack good social determinants of health, um, such as some of the ones that, that we've mentioned, you know, um, income, education, that, that education is huge. Um, and, um, you know, being a, of, you know, Aboriginal person of color, that, that, that may be a barrier to some people. So we need to encourage people uh, in those situations, um, again, not to be shy, uh, to try to find out uh, as much as you reasonably can, and we'll talk more about uh, that uh, later, uh, about clinical trials and what might be available to you and, and uh, you know, have those conversations with your doctors. Thank you so much. I could talk to you all day, as you know, and I think sometimes I have, <laughs> um, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll have to turn it over to the other experts on our panel. And uh, so I'll turn it back over to Kelvin to introduce to, uh, some questions to them. Yeah. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, David and Louise. I think with that uh, really important message from David and the discussion between David and Louise, it really set a very important uh, uh, context for our next two um, discussion. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lacey Petrie. Lacey, the floor is yours. 
All right, I'm hoping that you can hear me and I'm hoping that you can see my slides. And given I can't see anybody other than my slides, I'm gonna have to have Calvin, if you could say, yes, I can hear you and see you, that would be perfect. Yeah, you're doing great, thank you. Wonderful, okay. Well, uh, first things first, I, I wanna thank you, Dr. Chan, for uh, that kind introduction. And I also wanna thank BioCan RX for this opportunity to share our work. And also for this opportunity for me to learn more about what you do, which I think is uh, incredibly important. And so my job today is to actually take you on a bit of a voyage. Um, and I want to bring you to Sudbury, Ontario, which is where that tiny little red star is. And I'm going to tell you that it is currently snowing here. So it's probably a good thing that this is a theoretical voyage and not a true voyage because you probably don't want to be here today. But Ultimately, I want to talk to you about northeastern Ontario, which is that sort of large green area on the map of Ontario. And um, the reason why I want to talk to you about it is because it's a very unique area to be a patient, and it's a very unique area to be a doctor or a cancer doctor, which is what I do. So I am a chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and targeted pill therapy doctor. Um, and uh, myself and our group, our job is to make sure that cancer patients in northeastern Ontario get the best care possible. And um, it's a big task because this is a big area. So uh, the Northeastern Ontario is actually almost the size of Poland. Uh, and so you can imagine um, if you're trying to give people chemotherapy and immunotherapy and you're, you're, you have such a vast sort of land area that you kind of can't get all of the patients to drive up to Sudbury to get their treatment. And so the way that our um, system works is Sudbury is the main site and we have a hub and smoke, a spoke model with satellite sites and there are 12 of them. So Elliott Lake and Cochrane, Capus Casing, Kirkland Lake, Timmins. Um, these are places that um, are part of our hub and spoke model. And some of those sites are as far as 700 kilometers away. Uh, and so because of that uh, geography, uh, the doctors are in Sudbury, the cancer doctors are in Sudbury, and the patients get their treatment as close to home as possible. And so uh, because of this, over the course of the many years that we've been providing care across this sort of vast swath of land, we've become experts in providing virtual care. So prior to COVID, we were seeing one out of every three of our patients virtually. We were the biggest users of virtual care. Obviously, post-COVID, a lot of things have changed, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what we are very good at here is giving patients chemotherapy and immunotherapy and other treatments who are very far away from us. Okay. Some days we are really good at this and some days uh, the struggles uh, are very real. One of the biggest struggles that we've had is operating clinical trials. So we, we want patients to get the best care. We want them to get similar care if they were in Hamilton, Ottawa, or Toronto, but trying to do that here and trying to have the, the, the number of clinical trials that we need in the number of different cancer sites has always been a struggle. Right now we have about 20 clinical trials open, okay? And so the question is, why do we care about having clinical trials in Northeastern Ontario? And the answer is really easy for me. If I was a cancer patient, I would want to be able to, to have access to a clinical trial. And I want my family members who live here with me uh, to have that same access without having to travel far away from home. And participation in clinical trials is a good thing. Uh, and you know we've already heard a little bit about that, but you, know, you get the best standard treatment that's available, even if you're not given the new treatment, you're followed very closely. And there is a chance to help others and improve the way that we treat cancer in the future. And that's a beautiful thing. There's also this problem in Ontario and in some of the other provinces where uh, Canada will say, you know, yeah, yes, this drug is appropriate. And yes, this drug is the right drug. But there's this delay or this lag where patients in Ontario may not get access to the best drugs because of all the administration that needs to happen before um, every person gets access to the drug. And so there are these special things called phase four clinical trials where the drug has been approved. We know that the drug is the, the best drug at this time, but because there's no access for patients, they can go on these phase four trials and get access to the treatment. Um, and so all of these things mean that we really want patients, no matter where they live, to be able to participate in clinical trial. And then there's the missed opportunities. So we know that we want all types of people on clinical trial. We don't want at the end of a clinical trial to say, oh, 
this information and this data that we've collected, it only really pertains to people if they live within 100 kilometers of Toronto and Ottawa or Vancouver. What we want it to say is, you know, this is appropriate, this, this data makes sense, and it pertains to all Canadians. And so if we want to say that, then we have to make sure that all Canadians have an opportunity to participate. And what we know is that 78% of First Nation communities in Ontario are located in Northern Ontario. We also know that in Northeastern Ontario, 23% of our residents speak French as a first language um, compared to much lower levels in other places. So if we want to have better health equity for Indigenous and Francophone patients, if we want those patients to have access to clinical trial, then that means that clinical trials have to be available to them in Northern Ontario. And when I moved here to Sudbury to start uh, my practice, my interest is in lung cancer. I, I clearly remember I was young and naive. Now I'm just naive, <laughs> no longer young. But um, I, I met with a patient and sat down with her and we'll call her Mrs. X. And Mrs. X had a, a, a really tough diagnosis of small cell lung cancer, which is an aggressive form of lung cancer. And she said, Dr. Petrie, I'm so you know, excited to meet you. I, I've heard that you've opened up a new clinical trial called BMS451 for, for this type of cancer that I have. And I'd like to talk about being on it. And I said, you know what, Mrs. X, you're well, you're, you're motivated, you have the right type of cancer, you fit the criteria, and I think you would be a good fit. And she said, excellent. She said, well, you know, I can't leave my mom who's sick so I'm assuming you'll be able to give me this clinical trial in Kaposkiesing, which is where she lived. And Kaposkiesing is over 500 kilometers away from Sudbury. And I said, you know what, Mrs. X, I'm not sure I'm new around here, but let me find out uh, whether or not this is possible. And I sat down with our clinical trial team and I said, I want to give Mrs. X BMS 451 clinical trial in Kappa's casing. And they said, uh, no problem. Um, you're going to need to develop a clinical trials agreement between the two hospitals. You're going to need to convince Bristol Myers Squibb that we can safely do this. You're going to need to develop an ethics board in that hospital. You're going to be able to do, you have to do all of the pharmacist and nurse training. You need a plan for oversight. You're going to need 10 lawyers, five years, you're going to need the entire world to change their view on virtual medicine and its safety. And you're going to need to, wave, to change the way that we think about clinical trials and where they can be done in Canada. And obviously, that, um, that seemed like a mountain that was too high, too high to climb. And I sat down with Mrs. X and I explained to her that um, either she would need to come to Sudbury for clinical trial each time she was getting the treatment or she would need to, to go to Toronto where the, the trial was also open. And neither of those were, a, she was able to do neither of those things uh, because she needed to be close to home. And for that reason, Mrs. X did not participate in clinical trial. So my voice, the voice of the, um, the doctors, the patients and the administrators in Northern Ontario joined with the voices of many people who live in rural uh, and remote areas and 3CTN and CCTG, two of our national uh, groups that, that really help us understand how best and safely to, to participate in clinical trials and to navigate clinical trials. They said, we're listening, we hear you. And they put together a pan-Canadian group that include industry, patient representatives, researchers, oncologists, trials coordinators, administrators. And they ask the question, how do we make sure that everybody in Canada, no matter where they live, might in the future have access to clinical trials. And they identified that there were all sorts of large barriers and they put together a toolkit. This is a toolkit that helps you navigate ethics boards and make sure that you know how to uh, uh, train people. How do you make an agreement between hospitals? And at the end they said, okay, this is the toolkit and now we need some groups to give it a shot. And they put out a call across the nation and three sites were selected, one in Newfoundland, one in Prince George, British Columbia, and one with our group Health Sciences North in Sudbury, Ontario. And as simple as it could possibly be, they said, here are some resources, here is a toolkit. Try to open a single clinical trial in one of your satellite sites and let's see if you can do it. And we chose to open a clinical trial in Timmins, Ontario, 
and we chose to partner with Sault Ste. Marie, um, which already opens clinical trials because they have a cancer center there. And we chose to open a clinical trial together. And if you take a look here, what you see is the, the, the square area that we cover now that we're potentially going to be three groups working together with Timmins opening up. And all of a sudden you see that in that land area around Timmins, you see Capus Gasing, Cochrane, you see all of these places. And my hope is that we will see one day that Mrs. X could potentially be on clinical trial if we have it open in Timmins. And we had to choose a clinical trial and we decided to be very bold. And we decided to honor Mrs. X and Mrs. X's request and choose a study in lung cancer. And we also strongly believe that patients should have access to immunotherapy. And so the clinical trial that we chose is a lung cancer trial. And after chemotherapy and radiation, you either get the immunotherapy treatment that we know works best, or you get a double two immunotherapy agents, and we wonder if this might work even better. Okay. And we are in early, early, early days of this. We are six months in uh, to a you know 14 to 16 month process. And um, um, I, I wish I could tell you it's smooth sailing, but I also am happy to report that uh, we're learning uh, so, so very much about how to do this. And our hope is that whether we're successful or not, that what we've gone through and, and the information that we can bring back to the team will make it easier for the next attempt. And I, I really want to take this time to thank you for, um, for hearing about our efforts. I, I truly want to thank all of the patients involved in clinical trials. And I want to thank the administrators, uh, the team in Timmins and Sault Ste. Marie for their interest. Um, and thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Petrie. So we actually have some questions here. Um, so maybe we'll take a pause. Uh, and um, Lacey, if you don't mind taking this question, um, I think it's an excellent question here. Um, so for patients who decide to participate in clinical trials, uh, when sometimes the concern is that whether um, they may get the placebo rather than the experimental treatment. So what does it mean for the patient? Um, uh, what's your thought on that? Yeah, it, you know, and that's an excellent question. The, the first thing I think is a, is a misconception about clinical trials. And um, as, as I showed in the skyscraper clinical trials, so the, the arm, there is always an arm that gives you the best current standard of care. And so whether you're in clinical trial or not, that would be the recommended treatment plan, okay? Clinical trials also have another arm or maybe even several other arms where there are drugs that we think may work just as good or better, but we actually have no idea. Um, and so in those cases, when somebody is put on a clinical trial, they're put in one of those arms. And sometimes clinical trials, the patient knows which arm they're in. And sometimes the patient and the doctors don't know which, ar which arm. Um, and um, it really depends on what type of clinical trial a patient is, is on. Um, and it gets complicated. I know when patients are placed on a trial and they know which arm they're on, they very much want to be on that kind of new active arm with drugs that may be new or different. But when that happens, you know, we really want to set um, expectations that you have a chance of being in either arm and regardless of which arm, A, you're contributing to the knowledge and B, you're going to get very good care. And, um, but it's not easy. There's a lot of emotions around which arm you end up in and a lot of expectations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Um, David, um, do you have can, something? Could I make it? a, could I just yeah. ask a a, a, a follow-up question. Um, sometimes, is it true, Lacey, that sometimes these days, uh, because of the small groups of people, there are actually uh, there's actually only the one arm, which is the the drug that we're testing. Is that is that does that happen too? Yeah. So you know that's um that's a, a great question. And so a good example of that would be what what I had alluded to before, which is called a phase four trial. So a phase four trial is, okay, we've, you know, we've done a phase three, we've compared it to the standard. We know that this, this is the optimum treatment. 
And a phase four is when a company will actually say, okay, we're going to continue. We're going to open this trial trial where everybody on the trial gets access to the drug and we're going to learn more. We, what's, the, what's the best way to give this drug? What's the safest way to give this drug? We'll get some real world sort of data of the people who are actually on it. Phase four clinical trials can be really helpful in um, a certain provinces where, where there's a lag time and we don't have access to that drug yet particularly in pill form settings. So IV drugs are a lot easier for us to manage, but because we don't have a national pharmacare program, oral drugs, oral cancer drugs are, are very difficult to access sometimes. Good and question. if I could just add to that, uh, the trial that I'm on is a phase one trial and there is only one arm. So all of us get the treatment. Um, but uh, as Dr. Petrie explained, if you're, um, on a trial with um, more than one arm and, and um, it might be randomized and some people get the, um, the trial drug, um, everybody else gets the standard of care. And the only time it might be a placebo would be if the standard of care is just for monitoring, like there is no treatment. Um, so um, I think it's not very often, uh, Dr. Peter, you know better, but it's not very often uh, where patients in cancer trials get just a placebo. Yeah, you are completely correct. And, um, you know, Dr. Chan would potentially be a world expert on some of these questions. Uh, but um, uh, definitely the, the standard is you have to get the best care that we know of at this time. Um, otherwise, the clinical trials would never pass any of the ethics approvals, uh, and there are multiple before you can open up uh, trials. Yeah. Honestly, before I before we open up a clinical trial here in Sudbury, and I know the team in Toronto feels the same, I ask myself, would I put my, my mother on this clinical trial? Would I put my best friend on this clinical trial? And if the answer is no, then we, we don't talk about it. We don't open it. I think that's a great way of thinking about that. Um, and there's a follow-up question um, in the chat box asking about uh, when does a patient find out if they receive the placebo or the exper experimental drug? Um, I guess that goes to the concept of blinding. Um, um, so Lacey, do you want to take that one? Yeah, that is an, another excellent question. And not all clinical trials are blinded. So um, blinded means that the patient and, and the doctor don't know which arm, which type or active drug the patient is getting. And that seems a little silly. I think when, when I originally explained this to my mom, um, she, she didn't really understand why that would be the case. And, you know, I explained it's because if I know what uh, the patient is on, then I might be biased in my interpretation of whether the drug is working or not. And so blinding seems silly, but it actually is incredibly important. Um, and uh, in this case, when a patient's cancer starts to grow, that is one time when we would unblind and understand where they, where they were, um, which arm they were in, because that can sometimes help us in the future uh, understand what, what drugs we can consider next. And there are many other, other times if somebody is very, very sick and we're trying to understand what's happening, there are reasons to sort of unblind, but generally during the entire course of the treatment, myself and the patient wouldn't know which arm they're on. Thanks for the explanation. I think that's that's wonderful. It's often a confusing concept. Um, there's also one more question in the in the Q and A box. Um, interesting question. I think it's also for you, Lacey. Um, it's a question about um, um, does it take a lot of money to open the clinics for the craft trial? Yes, um, <laughs> so much. Um, Yes. And so I just think that's such a really good question um, because it's relevant and, and I'll explain. So when when we run a research department, we, we want to have balance. So we want to have pharmaceutical trials because those bring in um, a sort of more money. Um, and we also want to have academic trials and academic trials are actually really important, too, because they're not tied to any drug, not try, tied to any pharmaceutical company. They're only tied to the questions that we want to ask for patients. 
So, you know, do we really need to give that much radiation and do we really need to give that much chemo? Those are the types of questions that we ask with, with academic trials, but those are run by universities and they're run by CCTG. So they, we need a lot of funding to do, to ask those types of questions. It's actually one of the reasons why we chose Skyscraper, that clinical trial, because it's a pharmaceutical trial and we're hoping at a certain point that some of the things that we need, like for example, we need a trials coordinator who only works virtually. Um, our, our hope is that we'll have some extra funding to be able to hire that person so that the expertise can sort of remain in Sudbury as our trials coordinator sees those patients virtually with the doctors, the chemotherapy and immunotherapy nurses and the administrators in Timmins doing everything they can. Yeah. Good question, the answer is yes, too much. Always an interesting and challenging questions to figure out uh, sustainability for, uh, for our clinical trials machinery. Um, I think, that, why don't we do one more question and then we should probably move on to our last panelist. So, so um, I think this is also a question for you, Lacey. Um, the question is about uh, whether there's a possibility to see more and more of the type of um, clinics and clinical trials opening in every remote areas. What's your vision on that? So, um, you know, we are in such early days and I can't stress this enough. We're, we're um, you know, we're, we're in day one really of trying to understand, is this feasible? And the, the question has to be every single day, is this safe for patients? And if we ever get a signal that this is not safe for patients to have them on a, on a clinical trial in a remote or a rural area, then, then we have to pull back and we start again. Um, that's patient safety is always number one. Uh, we would absolutely love that. We have 12 satellite sites, and in, in an ideal world, we would be able to deliver those treatments in each of those satellite sites. That would be perfect. But but really, in the in the the long term, it th there are so many possibilities if we truly believe in virtual medicine and we believe in this idea of satellite sites providing clinical trials. Because one day, what I see is I would love for my site to be a satellite of Princess Margaret and all of those amazing clinical trials that would be available there that we could potentially, um, you know, work through the ethics and and the regulatory elements and we could open those clinical trials here and then patients would have just vast access. Um, that would be a beautiful thing. Right now, it's a, it's a bit of a pipe dream, but um, the first step is craft. That's perfect. I think with that, um, we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. John Bell um, as our um, third panelist, who will be telling us a little bit more about uh, uh, clinical trials, immunotherapy clinical trials, uh, from his perspective as a scientist. Um, Dr. Bell has, actually has kindly pre-recorded uh, his presentation, just because that could theoretically be uh, uh, technical challenges. So uh, he very kindly has uh, made the preparation ahead of time for that. So, so I will turn it over to the Balkan Eric's um, technical expert to play Dr. Bell's recording. But Dr. Bell is actually with us uh, in person as well. So he'll be able to take questions afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Bell. I, I'm happy to speak to you today and talk to you about some of the work I've been doing over the last several decades. And really, the, the title of this talk is, you know, Developing Cancer Therapeutics Along a Winding Road. And it is a really long and, and interesting pathway to get to where we are today. Uh, and I hope to give you some ideas about how cancers arise and, and why this has been so challenging for us. But I really am also very optimistic that we have some new things coming along the pipe that's going to provide a new uh, a suite of in interesting and important uh, therapeutics for the treatment of cancer. Now, just for context, if I said to you, I know a woman who's undergoing cancer chemotherapy, an image like this might come to your mind. She's being treated with chemotherapy, it's attacking her cancer, 
But unfortunately, it's also attacking her normal tissues. So, tissues. so she's lost her hair. But worse than that, the chemotherapy is attacking her immune si system, suppressing her immune system, maybe making sores in her mouth and so on. And so the problem with chemotherapy is although it attacks the cancer, it also attacks your normal tissues. You have what we call a very narrow therapeutic window where the chemotherapy is able to get the cancer but leave the normal tissues unscathed. And so that's really the challenge with chemotherapy. What we're all aiming for is to get something we call cancer-targeted therapies, therapies that attack the cancer only and leave normal tissues unscathed. And I want to speak to you today about what are called virus and immune-based cancer therapies because I think this is a really important new approach to treating cancer that's going to change the way, uh, change and improve outcomes for cancer patients. Now, just to start, uh, let me just tell you a little bit what we've learned over the last 30, 40 years of studying cancer biology. Uh, we know that cancers arise in normal, healthy tissues in people. So they have normal cells that acquire mutations over the lifetime of that person. And those mutations can happen in important genes which control the growth of the cell. And as a result, you go from a normal cell ultimately to a frankly malignant and dangerous tumor that can spread throughout your body. Importantly, one of the mutations that happens within these cancer cells is it allows them to acquire the ability to be stealth and hide from our immune systems. So normally our immune systems are patrolling our body and looking for ways to eliminate cancer cells because they're not supposed to be there. If they've got mutations, they look differently. But cancer cells acquire ways to become stealth and avoid being attacked by the immune system. So that, that's one important thing. The other important thing is since cancers arise in our own cells, in our own DNA, then it means that each person's cancer is as unique as they are. Each person's cancer is genetically unique. So the idea of getting one size fits all therapeutic, a magic bullet that's gonna treat everybody's cancer is just not gonna happen. We need to have new ways to create regimens or treatments that allow a therapy to really to be personalized for that individual patient. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that the way we think we can do that best is to use each person's immune system to tailor an immune response that's specific for their therapy. And that would give a really nice personalized uh, attack to the cancer and help eliminate. So just to give you some context about how I think about this, back in 1966, I was a prepubescent boy, loved going to movies, and one movie that came out that really captured my imagination was called Fantastic Voyage. In this movie, the President of the United States had something wrong with his brain. Well, that's not unusual, I suppose, but in this case, he actually had a tumor in his brain that was inoperable. And so scientists wanted to save him. So what they did is they climbed inside a submarine and they shrunk that submarine down so they could inject it into his blood system and they could drive around in that, in that submarine looking for the cancer and then use their lasers to, to eliminate it. So, you know, a really interesting sci-fi idea, but it's always sort of stuck with me over these years. And I realize now we're actually doing this sort of thing now, but instead of submarines, we're using immune cells that we program to attack cancers or viruses that we've created that are parasites of cancers. And they move through your blood system looking for the tumor where it is and attacking it selectively. We've really entered into the era of what I'd call living drugs, drugs which actually are alive or derived from living tissues and rather than chemicals or radiation. And these are the things that I think are going to change the way we treat patients and the outcomes that they so how did I get to where we are today? Uh, I'm not a real doctor. I'm a mouse doctor, not a human doctor. And I work with mouse models trying to find ways to treat cancer. So one of the ways we do this is we, we give mice cancer in a very artificial way and these tumors form in the, in the mice and they spread throughout their body. The mice get very sick very quickly and then ultimately they'll succumb to their disease if we don't do something to help them. So to give you an example of what this looks like, Here's a set of lungs from a healthy, non-smoking mouse. Nice pink lungs, nice big heart, looks great. We give them the cancer uh, through the blood vessels and you see that the lungs become loaded with tumors in a matter of a few weeks. And these animals are obviously gonna die of their disease if we don't do something to help them. So what we did is we created a virus that we thought would be specific for cancers, infect and parasitize only them. And we injected that, those animals with this virus. And here you can see the results. So here again are these tumor-bearing lungs. They look terrible. We injected the, the animal with a virus in which we had cloned a gene from jellyfish. You know how jellyfish glow in the ocean? We took that gene out, put it in the virus. So wherever the virus infects, it fluoresces, it creates a green signal. And you can see here in this animal that's been treated, these white nodules have turned green. Where there's pink tissue and no tumor, it stays dark. So we had created a very selective virus that can infect and kill tumors, but not normal tissues. This is one of the things we're aiming for. So quite excited about that. And ultimately all those animals were cured of their disease and, and everything looked really great. So I was excited about this. Went to speak to my boss.
asked about it. My boss is a Rebecca Hour, Dr. Rebecca Hour, who's a very brilliant woman uh, and cancer surgeon who works at our cancer center. And I said, Rebecca, look, isn't this great what we've done? And she said, well, that's fantastic, John, but let me point something out to you. In fact, whether you notice it or not, mice are not men. And so what you've found in the mice is great, but you really need to do clinical studies to figure out if this is going to work. You need to have clinical trials so you can see if it's not working, how you can make it better. So I just want to t t touch now on a couple of clinical studies that we're involved in that allowed us to see how these viruses were working and, and what we could do to make them better. So here's one. This is a friend of mine, Dave Bartlett, who works as a surgeon in Pittsburgh. And he had a patient who you could see this horrible mass on his arm. He was a, a patient who didn't have health insurance and didn't go in and get treated until it actually got to quite a bad stage. And then Dave was allowed to treat him. Uh, by injection right here, which is just shown blown up at the top. This is the area where he injected. So before treatment, it looks like this. After treatment, you can see the virus has gone in, starts to eat away that tumor, and he, ultimately that area of injection is cleared. But even more importantly, if you look at this big ugly thing here, you see over time that it's getting smaller and smaller. And so we were really excited about this and thought the virus is eating through this tumor. But when Dave biopsied that, that part of the tumor and it looked for virus, there was no virus there. But what there was there was immune cells. And so the act of the virus infecting the tumor had awakened the immune system to recognize this cancer as foreign. So the viruses initiate the infection, start to kill the tumor, but it's really the immune system of the patient that helps it uh, eventually disappear and, and go away and stay. Here's another patient uh, who was treated with a different virus. This is not a virus we developed, uh, but another one in the field. This is a gentleman who has melanoma on his scalp. You can see he's got lots of tumors. Uh, when they were injected, you can see actually, if anything, it looks a little bit worse. There seems to be new growths here. Some are swelling and looking worse. But that's only because the virus had gone in and began to infect and call in the immune system. And these tumors started to swell a little bit like a, like a sprained ankle. Uh, in this case, we combined the virus with an immune therapy. And what you can see over time is that this uh, looks a bit worse, but starts to get better. And ultimately, this gentleman had a complete response and his tumors were, were cleared everywhere as a result of combining this virus therapy with immunotherapy. I just want to end with telling you about one other new example of, of how this is working and why we're so excited about immunotherapy. This is something called CAR-T therapy. Chimeric antigen receptor means CAR. Uh, it's a way of engineering a person's immune system to recognize their cancer as foreign. What we do in this case is we take the, the immune cells out of a patient, we then engineer them with a virus, a different kind of virus, so they now express a new protein on their surface that can bind to cancer cells specifically. And then we put these cells back in the patient. So what we're hoping to do is get these immune cells that are activated and engineered with the virus to recognize cancer cells, bind onto them, kill them, and destroy them. So does this work? Here is probably one of the greatest stories that you'll hear uh, about how this can work. This is a story of Emily Whitehead who back in 2012 or so uh, had unfortunately uh, developed uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia and was going to die of her disease. She'd been treated for a couple of years and everything was failing. And you can see this poor young girl at this stage is really in the terminal stages of disease. And in fact, at this point, her, patient, her parents were told there was nothing else to be done for her. So they agreed to put her on a clinical study, a clinical trial being run by a, a friend of mine, Carl June. And, and this involved using engineered T cells to see if they could actually find a way to kill off uh, this young girl's leukemia. And she was the first pediatric patient to be treated. Turned out it worked amazingly well. She had a great response. And here she is, this should be 2021. Nine years later, young, beautiful young girl uh, who's having a great life and has become cancer free. So it just shows you how the value, the power of clinical studies. We learned a lot from what Emily went through. We're making better CAR T's now. We're getting better treatment responses. And it's all because we had done clinical studies with these experimental therapeutics. And we did what we called high content trials, trials in which we learned a lot from each patient. So that, that's Emily's story. It's a great story. There's lots of other patients out there who have benefited from this therapy. And we've now started to do this in Canada through BioCanerax Grant and other funding agencies, including the BC Cancer Agency. So just to end, BioCanerax believes in immunotherapy. We think this is something that we need to keep developing and really accelerate into the clinic, test it in many different ways. There's lots of kinds of immunotherapies I didn't even speak about today. But we believe that the power to kill cancer does lie within us. We can educate our immune systems to be, do what they're supposed to do and find and kill cancer cells. And that's really what I'm really excited about. I think the future of cancer therapy is completely different. We're going to have better outcomes for patients, and, I, and I'm really excited about it. So thanks very much for your attention.
Thank you, John. And I think with that, uh, we'll be opening up for questions from all the participants. And I think uh, maybe if all the panelists can turn on their camera as well um, for our discussion. Just looking at our Q&A box, um, I think maybe to help us get started, um, I think we have talked about clinical trials and, and importantly, immunotherapy related clinical trials and, and sometimes may not be very clear to, to patients or even to uh, people in the clinical space. Um, what are some of the key differences um, and what does it mean to patients in terms of access to care and other aspects? I don't know if any one of you want to take a crack at this. Uh, Lacey, if you, if you don't mind me picking on you from a clinical perspective, and maybe after that, maybe John from a, sci uh, from a research scientist perspective. And, and then after that, maybe David, um, from your personal experience, if you don't mind um, helping us thinking about immunotherapy, clinical trials versus other clinical trials. I'd be happy to start. So um, I think it's important to understand that although immunotherapy sounds very new, um, we actually use it in clinical practice for almost every type of cancer at this time. Uh, and so five, six, or seven years ago, we were, you know, we were doing mostly clinical trials and immunotherapy was, you know, very nerve wracking to be using because we were, you know, we knew how to use chemotherapy. That was old news, but using immunotherapy, there were all sorts of side effects that we were starting to, you know, see and we, and we wanted to understand. Um, and so now we use immunotherapy every single day. We probably use as much immunotherapy as chemotherapy in uh, the clinic uh, downstairs. Um, and we use it in almost every disease site. And you know, the key thing is that when we're using immunotherapy, sometimes the immune system gets almost too activated. And so it can do some bad things in the sense that uh, instead of just attacking cancer, it can attack things like the lungs or the colon. Um, people can feel short of breath. They can have bad diarrhea and run into some big problems. But what we're seeing now is um, that we have much more experience in managing these side effects. And, um, and unlike chemotherapy, immunotherapy has a bit of a turnoff switch. We can give somebody steroids and we can kind of put the immune system to sleep a little bit. And so um, a few differences are in immunotherapy trials, we have an on off switch that we can use. And chemotherapy is not like that. Once I give it to, there's no take backs. Um, and so sometimes it's a little bit easier to sort of manage those side effects. The second thing is when you have a patient on immunotherapy, they might get a bad arthritis because of the immunotherapy and you might need a rheumatologist or an arthritis doctor, or they might get irritation to the colon and the rectum and you might need a gastroenterologist or a gut doctor. And so when you're running a trial with immunotherapy, you really wanna make sure that you have the right doctors around to help you support those patients. Whereas chemotherapy, we, we sort of know what we're managing and, and we know what we're getting into. But also immunotherapy in uh, my estimation, as well as it's borne out in clinical trials when they're used head to head, seems to have quite a few less side effects than chemotherapy. Um, and so the trials are a bit easier to run, but when you run into a side effect, it can be a bigger it can be a bigger problem. We need to use our turnoff valve, which we hesitate to use because we want that immune therapy, that immune system strong. I'm not sure if I quite answered that question, but hopefully David will clear the rest, <laughs> clear that up for me. <laughs> uh, uh, sure, unless uh, John, if you'd like to mention anything. Well, uh, just to follow up on uh, a comment that uh, John made, he, he uh, mentioned uh, CAR T cell therapy, and this is something that, that is being used more and more now, certainly in the area of blood cancers for lymphoma, leukemia. In myeloma, um, it's uh, uh, still very much in the research world, um, uh, and uh, it's, it's showing promise, but uh, you know, I think we are a little ways away from using that um, as a standard of care treatment in, in the clinic. Um, the immunotherapy that I'm taking part in now, the trial, um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the bi-specific antibody, um, the initial response uh, was very rapid um, and I've had uh, fewer side effects than any other treatment I've ever had uh, before. 
Um, and this might not be the same uh, experience for everybody, but for many patients that I know, the side effects of the immunotherapies, just as Dr. Petrie explained, uh, are usually milder than for the previous therapies that uh, uh, they had. David, yeah. could I, um, sorry, just before yes. you, you, I just want to ask a little clarifying question, if you don't sure. mind. Yep. Um, I know you do a lot of work with patients mm -hmm. and what we've heard from Lacey and John, and particularly John, uh, about immunotherapies is so exciting, mm -hmm. but it's fairly technical. And I'm wondering how we help uh, through maybe through your work or other people's work to sort of create some knowledge translation, if you like, um, to explain these things. Um, you're an expert, but other patients aren't. Um, are there ways to help patients understand this in a kind of lay way? <laughs> well, yes. Um, the immunotherapies, uh, tend to be, the treatments tend to be, you know, somewhat disease specific. So for example, an immunotherapy that would be uh, potentially beneficial for me uh, would probably not be beneficial for uh, a lung cancer patient. You know, it might be, but chances are it's a different type of immunotherapy. So um, I, I think a lot of that knowledge um, is best coming from uh, the, the doctors uh, who uh, work in the specific field, like, for example, a myeloma, it'd be myeloma doctors, um, and lung cancer be lung cancer doctors, who uh, would know the specific immunotherapies um, that are beneficial to that particular group of patients. Um, and uh, the challenge there, um, and I know some doctors are really good at this, uh, is explaining things um, about immunotherapy or any other type of treatment in terms that uh, patients can understand. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I suggested that that's a, that's a, and many doctors do it very well. And, and I'm sure Dr. Petrie does it well, like just from knowing you a little bit. Um, but there's an opportunity there uh, that we do quite a bit in the myeloma community, but in other types of cancers um, for, uh, you know, doctors who are, you know, specializing in that particular, particular type of cancer to uh, educate, uh, you know, the patient group, uh, patient population for that particular type of cancer um, in the immunotherapies. As, as far as, um, you know, anything that somebody could read, you know, there's there's Google, of course, but I, I think the, the best thing is to hear directly from a doctor on, you know, what is a particular immunotherapy for, you know, your cancer? How does it work? What are the benefits, side effects, etc.? Yeah, I mean, Dr. Google, I've never seen any of his medical certificates. So no. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm highly suspicious of that particular doctor. Yeah, right, yes. John? Right, yes. John? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I just... If I could, uh, can you hear me okay now? Is my, my connection better? Good. So I think Lacey and David sort of nailed it on the head. What the what's, what we need to do here is we need to have more trials in this space. Uh, when I mentioned Emily Whitehead's story, for instance, Emily, uh, you know, it, it's a great outcome for her, but the reality is she was the first patient on trial, and, and unfortunately she almost died from the treatment because it was just we didn't know how we were doing it. Fortunately, because we had, it was done in a trial setting and we had some really smart people looking at the problem, she was treated with a drug which is actually used for, for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, sort of out of the, out of the uh, you know, would have thought to do this, but because the people following her were, were very careful and were watching, they recognized that she was producing a new hormone during the treatment uh, that was one that they'd seen for rheumatoid arthritis. So they very quickly treated her with that drug and it saved her life and she's now gone on to have a complete cure. And that drug is now used routinely for CAR T therapy in, in combination. So we learn so much from each one of these patients. It's amazing and hopefully they will, many will benefit in hematology. Many do benefit from us so far, which is great. But um, I, you know, we just learn so much each time because we, we follow them very carefully. And, you know, David, I, I, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but when, you, when you're on trial, you're a bit of a guinea pig because we're mm. constantly poking you with needles, I'm sure. And what we're doing is, is getting samples so we can learn from you. And then the next patient down the road will 
do well and maybe have even fewer side effects. I think, as Lacey mentioned, we have some control over this treatment and we're getting better at it, but the long-term side effects probably are going to be better uh, in the end when we figure this all out than they are for currently for chemotherapy. There's a study I mentioned to Steph that a follow-up of, of kids who were treated with chemotherapy and cured of their disease have a 30% shorter life expectancy. They often will die in their 50s instead of in their 80s, and that's because there's cumulative problems with chemotherapy that we just never recover from. So I think that now we're in a great spot where we're starting to learn more, and there's going to be some more hiccups along the way, and maybe major hiccups, but I'm confident that the beauty of it is once you educate your immune system to recognize the cancer as a foreign thing, it'll keep attacking it and keep it at bay. It's got memory. It remembers what's going on, and so when the cancer tries to come back, the immune system attacks again. So that, that's at least the vision and the dream of it all. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that, since I started the trial three months ago, I, I've had more than 100 vials of, of blood drawn um, for research. Uh, and, and I'm totally on board with that, even though I won't know the results. That's, that's done you know, behind the scenes. Uh, and the blood drawing is, is done in a way that you know, minimizes discomfort for me. But uh, I, I'm totally happy being a guinea pig <laughs> in, in that regard, John. Great. That's good. We'll poke you some more. But actually, okay. you know what's interesting, David, is that, is that particular therapy uh, that you're on, uh, is, it's like CAR therapy. It's using an antibody to link an immune cell to a cancer cell and destroy it. So it's very, uh, yes. it's another version of it. So it's actually really cool. And that's something that you can keep being treated with. Uh, and so uh, fingers crossed for you. Oh, oh, th thank you. That, that's why it's called bispecific. You know, it hooks onto the cancer cell and, to, and also onto a, a T cell, which is part of the immune system. Great. Uh, and John, actually, there's a, uh, there's a question from the audience, I think, uh, related to your presentation. And uh, I think the, the question is about, uh, what, in your opinion, what's the biggest hurdle uh, about um, translating your work from mice to human? I think MS means mice here. Uh, if I misunderstood, please um, send the question in again. Uh, let's assume that's the meaning. Yeah, it, it's a great question, actually. And you know, back to Lacey's point, this cost a lot of money, unfortunately, and right now, our government doesn't recognize the value, in my opinion, of, of the clinical studies, and so they don't fund clinical studies. And, and, and to my mind, you know, it, it, people are now benefiting from these clinical studies, even in phase one, it's quite clear. So uh, to me, this should become part of the care, you know, the patient care package, and government should help support these clinical studies, because they do cost a lot of money. So although David very kindly gives us his blood. It's a lot of people behind the scenes having to analyze that blood and so on. And, and, and that costs money and the data collection costs money. The uh, study coordinators, as Lacey mentioned, all these things are, are, are a cost that needs to be borne somewhere. And if, if our government doesn't help out with that, then we're dependent upon pharma companies, as Lacey said. And, you know, I think it's much better for us if we have a different source of cash besides that that allows us to do the kinds of studies that, that people really need. And I think people really want as well, because these are something that, you know, as Lacey mentioned, you know, we live, we live beside the United States, but they have many, many more options for treating cancer patients than we do, unfortunately, right now. But we could have those same things for us if we had a very well-supported clinical trial system. So for me, that's the biggest thing is getting the money to support clinical studies so people like Lacey can do, uh, do her work and see what's happening. And then, you know, call me up and say, you know, that's a great idea, John, but do you see what happened? This patient, you know, had this, this problem, and then we can adjust it and tweak it very quickly and get it to a, a better spot. Another thing that um, uh, happens with me in this trial, aside from, you know, drawing the blood, um, I spent uh, well, six days so far um, uh, in, in a hospital. You know, they treated me very well. I'm, I'm not sick, so I felt fine. But it, it was for observation to learn as much as possible about any side effects that I might have uh, in any regard. Uh, so again, I'm totally on board with that. The more they can learn from me, the better it will be, you know, not just for me, but more importantly, for future patients. I think we have another question from the audience. Um, and I think this question 
probably can go to Lacey or John and, and David, if you have some experience, I think that would be also a, a good one for you too. I think the question is about uh, what are the less positive side effects of these therapy? And um, I, I would take it uh, less positive means that potential side effects, challenges for, and these therapies, I would take it as maybe for immunotherapy perhaps. And, and so if I misunderstood the question, please again, correct me in the Q and A. Um, but, uh, otherwise, I'll pass it over to maybe Lacey first, and then John, and perhaps me. Okay. So, uh, as a, a few of the panelists have alluded to, there are different types of immunotherapy, and uh, the, the type of immunotherapy that we're using really frequently in solid tumors, so uh, cancers like uh, breast cancer and lung cancer, uh, and um, kidney cancer, as opposed to blood tumors, is uh, we call them PDL1, PD1 inhibitors or CTLA4 inhibitors. Don't you remember anything like that? But basically, it's the it's the straightforward. We're taking the immune system, and the immune system has a break and a gas, and we're ripping out the breaks and saying you're not allowed to stop. You just have to work, 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 and then we're pressing on the gas. So those are sort of two different ways to make the immune system aggressive and two different ways that the traditional immunotherapy treatments are working. So I know a lot about using those. I know very much, uh, very little about CAR-T therapy because it doesn't, hasn't really moved into the, the disease sites that I treat. But the thing is, is that when you uh, rip out the brakes and push on the gas pedal of immunotherapy or of your immune system, you can run into a lot of potential side effects just seems like many patients don't have a lot of side effects, but if they do, it's kind of a big one. And the most common side effect that we see on immunotherapy is the thyroid, which is the organ that sort of sits on your neck, and it produces chemicals that help you keep your energy and stop you from becoming constipated and all of these things. It's actually a really important organ, but we know that the immune system likes to go and irritate that. Um, and the good news is that it's pretty easy to fix with some thyroid hormones, and we kind of watch carefully. But that's pretty much the most common thing that we see. The good news is we can fix and watch that really carefully with blood work, which, which David's really uh, used to. Um, the other things are things that are a little bit more scary. And this is why it's so important if you're on immunotherapy. We actually, our patients have a, an immunotherapy bracelet that says, I am on immunotherapy. And we encourage them to use it because if anything ever happens, we don't want people to think they're on normal chemotherapy and we don't want them to think that they're not on anything because an immunotherapy patient has a completely different way to treat those problems. So if the immune system attacks the lungs, it can cause something called pneumonitis and a patient would feel shortness of breath. If it attacked the colon, they would have diarrhea and maybe even bloody diarrhea. And so if a patient on immunotherapy develops one of these side effects, they, they can't just wait and say, oh, you know, it's just diarrhea. If you're having, you know, more than four or five diarrhea in a day, you have to call in. So there's a lot of teaching, a lot of education around patients on immunotherapy. Just like if you're on chemotherapy, we would teach you to come in if you had a fever. On immunotherapy, we teach you to call in if you're feeling more short of breath or having diarrhea or if something feels off. The main difference is the earlier I know something's wrong, the earlier I can figure out what it is. And if it's immunotherapy and the gas pedal is being pushed too hard or the brakes aren't on enough and the immune system is attacking something that we need to protect, then we would start steroids right away to sort of blunt that. The, the opposite is true though. We don't want patients accidentally taking prednisone or dexamethasone, which are steroids, because we want the immune system to be strong. We don't want them to accidentally turn that off. Um, so it's kind of um, following, following that piece. But in a very good study that looked at a group of lung cancer patients, they said, we're gonna take this group of lung cancer patients, we're gonna put them on one immunotherapy agent, or we're gonna put them on two chemotherapy drugs. We're gonna see how this works. They were a very selective group of patients. What they found was that the immunotherapy patients had half of the number of side effects as the chemotherapy patients, but don't let that fool you into thinking immunotherapy is perfect because when something bad happens, it can happen really quickly. You really wanna to talk to your doctor if something's changing. Yeah, I, I think uh, Lacey has nailed it again. I, I think the future uh, is going to be, first of all, learning to understand this problem that she's just described. But right now, when we give immunotherapy, the way we give it is, again, so, well, maybe the term is systemically, the, the immunotherapy goes everywhere. 
And if it's really active, as, as Lacey mentions, you can sometimes get these autoimmune results where, again, your normal tissues can be sometimes impacted, but we can, we can control that with steroids. So the future is going to be finding ways to make the immunotherapy act only within the tumor. And this is what people are looking towards now. So that, that storm that happens when the immune system gets activated will only happen within the tumor. And so that's coming down the pipe. We, 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 but we've only are knowing to do this because of the clinical studies but we've learned that when you give it systemically, you're going to have this issue that you need to deal with. So can we find ways now to direct that immune storm only in the tumor itself? And, and that's really the next thing that we're learning. And, and so the dream is that we'll get really good at, at dealing with this. And, and uh, you know, I must say I feel bad for Lacey because, first of all, she had to learn to do chemotherapy. And we said, okay, we're going to change that now, to completely rip up that playbook. Got a new one for you. And, and these are all new therapies that are coming down the pipe, and, and so she's got to learn, go back to medical school again, and learn it all over again. So prepare yourself, Lacey. There's more coming, and you're going to have to <laughs> learn about these new uh, new therapies, which had really interesting and I think exciting uh, profiles, but they re they do require a whole new uh, learning experience. And I think one of the challenges you face, Lacey, in your trials is getting your colleagues at distant sites up to speed with what what to expect with these kinds of therapeutics. You are correct. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it's it's a scary thing for us. Um, uh, you, you know, when I first, um, I, I did all my training at McMaster and, you know, I started the patient on treatment. I saw the patient before every single cycle of treatment, whether it was, you know, chemotherapy, I knew exactly what was going on. Uh, but here my patient might be 650 kilometers away from me. Uh, and regardless if they're on trial or not, depending on a lot of people to recognize this might be a side effect of this treatment. I need to get Dr. Petrie aware of what's going on right away. And so, um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's sometimes like having a child go off to college. I think you know you're just you just are really really hoping uh, that they'll call you if something goes wrong right away. Um, and it involves a lot of education, and we really need to encourage patients to speak up. And if that's one thing that I that I hope comes out of this is. You know, if you're talking to your doctor and they're talking about immunotherapy and you don't you don't get what they're saying, ask them again, ask their nurse to go through it again, tell them that you want to talk about it. And we doctors, I think I've, I've done a full hour long consult. The first time I met you, I explained what immunotherapy is. And now, you know, and your family knows. And that's it. Um, but the next visit, ask me again. And the, the next visit after that, ask me again and review why are we doing this? What is our goal? Is this going to cure me or is this going to keep me here longer? Is this, you know, am I going through the expected course? Am I, am I having more side effects? You know, what's going on with my care and, you know, what, what can we do better? Um, and uh, you're right, when you have 15 minutes to talk to a patient and follow up, it's not enough to do everything. And so patients need to say, hey, I need to put the brakes on. I need to talk to you. I need to ask these questions. You need to take the time to answer them. And I can't imagine any doctor who would say, you know, I don't have time uh, for that. We, we have to take the time. And could I could I just um, <clears throat> say that uh, on behalf I'm going to speak for you, Dr. Petrie. My guess, and you can correct me, is that no matter the the fact that you're going to have to learn a lot of new things, the fact that it's going to make such a profound difference um, in your patients is is worth the education. I'm suspecting from your side. My goal is for me to not have a job. So I would like for treatments to work so well uh, that the minute cancers happen, we detect them, we treat them, we destroy them, and um, I will take up a singing career. I will do anything. <laughs> I will not get paid. I will not get paid well for my singing career. But yeah, and and also I'm, I firmly believe that you know in 30 years when my career is hopefully winding down, hopefully I've paid off my student loans. <laughs> um, you know, that I'll look back and I'll think, oh my goodness, what a Neanderthal I was, uh, you know, in 2021 and and look at the strides we've made and, and look at how personalized this medicine is. And then I think that's sort of what we're dancing around right now is a lot of the treatments that we're using are, are not personalized. Chemotherapy is not personalized. It's not meant for your body and your cancer. And even the traditional forms of immunotherapy that we're using routinely are not personalized. They're trying to convince your immune system to do what we want it to do, but we're really just being very nonspecific. But 
things like CAR T and, uh, you know, things that like John are talking about where, you know, we're taking the immune system and like a dog, we're saying, this is the scent, this is what we want you to get. And then we're putting our trained dogs back in you uh, as the immunotherapy, as the immune cells, you know, this is the way of the future. And my hope is that I will absolutely be out of a job. And I hope that Lisa, you and I will get to retire early. Uh, <laughs> That'd be so good. <laughs> um, actually, there's a follow-up question. I think that um, ties into the side effect discussion well. So maybe I'll ask that one first. And then there's another very good question um, about um, uh, as a community, what we can do about uh, clinical trials and new immunotherapy to make it more accessible and affordable. So, so that may be the second question we'll come back to. So first of all, the first question about the side effects. Uh, the question was about, um, do, um, so what do we do when side effects happen? Um, do they stop the treatment immediately or do they try to decrease dosages or what are, they, what are usually the management uh, strategy? So maybe this one, Lacey, if I can turn it to you. Yeah. So, so this is like, this is the paradigm shift for, for doctors like me who treat patients with immunotherapy. So chemotherapy generally, you know, if you give hundred percent of the chemo dose, you might get hundred percent of the symptoms. And so the next cycle, if somebody had bad side effects, you go down on the chemotherapy dose and patients feel better. It's not like that with immunotherapy. And we're learning so much about what doses of immunotherapy, you know, do we have to give it every three weeks? Can we give it every six weeks? Like how often do we need to give this? Um, and it's, it's complicated. But one of the things that we've learned is that coming down on the dose of immunotherapy doesn't, doesn't really change much. You know, you need an interruption. So what's happened is the immune system has started to, you know, it's lost its brake pedal and it's um, you've pushed on the gas. And so the immune system is just acting really aggressive and it's lashing out. It's, it's hitting things that it shouldn't like the lungs or the colon. And so what you need to do is you need to interrupt that cycle. And so you give steroids, you calm down the T cells, you calm down the immunotherapy um, uh, treatment effects. And then for a period of time, you give that patient a break and you say, okay, you know, what, what's going on? What's going to happen? Is this patient going to recover from those side effects? And usually they do. And if they don't recover from those side effects with steroids alone, then you need to add something else, like one of those drugs that you would give if somebody had rheumatoid arthritis that calmed down the immune system. And then depends how brave you and your patient is. So sometimes you restart. Um, and sometimes the side effect that they had was so dangerous that you say we can't. But what I tell patients is if you have a really big, bad, nasty side effect to immunotherapy, we're not going to panic. You're going to tell me right away, we're going to fix the problem. And then we're going to watch you potentially. And um, I actually have more than one patient in my practice. And I almost want to knock on wood because I don't want these effects to go away. But one of them had a terrible pneumonitis or an inflammation in the lungs after immunotherapy. This was four and a half years ago. I've never had the courage to restart the immunotherapy because this patient got very sick and their lung cancer has never changed. So they have been off of therapy for four and a half years after this big side effect. And so it uh, presumably the cancer is still there, but being kept under control long term by this kind of severe immunotherapy side effect. So even sometimes patients who have terrible side effects, the long-term effects could be greatly beneficial. We don't know enough about those patients. That's another incredibly important subgroup of patients, these, these long-term responders. You know, what is it about them uh, that keeps this can cancer under control? And how do we replicate that in everybody? How do we make that every single patient? Thank you, Lacey. This is really good. Um, Looking at the time, I think we may be looking at possibly the last question. Um, but before we go there, I think um, someone from the audience, um, Claudia, want to share with us a story that uh, um, that she had 30 treatments of BCG for bladder cancer. Um, and since then, there was some side effects seemingly because of um, the need to take thyroid medications for the thyroid, as well as arthritis. But, uh, but uh, she's now five years with no signs of cancer. That's a very, very good story to, to know that, uh, Claudia, you're doing well. Thank you for sharing that. With that, I think we probably will be going to the last question for our panel. Um, so the question is, um, how can we as a community uh, make clinical trials and new immunotherapy drugs more accessible and also more affordable to cancer patients? Um, very difficult questions, but it's a very important question for us to think about the future. So I think with that, um, 
David, would you mind uh, sharing your thoughts with us on that? And then after that, perhaps with Lacey and then, and then with John thinking about the future from a science research perspective? Sure. Well, um, the first thing to make uh, immunotherapies more accessible is what we're talking about now, more research, research, clinical trials uh, to uh, determine which immunotherapies uh, work. Some of them might require some adjustments, some tweaking, but that, that is step one. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, these therapies need to be reviewed and approved by the regulatory agencies like Health Canada. Um, and, um, and then there's, uh, you know, discussions um, with the uh, primarily the provincial governments and organizations like CADF um, and um, similar organizations that are determining, uh, you know, the, the, the pricing. I mean, that, that's a whole uh, separate topic of discussion. But uh, the biggest thing we can do now, uh, again, is continue with the great research that is underway. Um, I know there's a, a lot of interest, just as, as an example, two weeks from now, um, the American Society of Hematology, which has hematologists from all over the world, uh, takes place. And, you know, the big topic of discussion will be immunotherapies. Um, and uh, for us in, you know, the myeloma world and other hematologic world, and, and I'm sure solid tumors as well, um, it's, it provides uh, encouragement and hope for us in, in the future. I think it was me next. Um, you know, I um, have been accused of being a very concrete thinker. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, David, Kelvin, uh, I think you guys are often thinking nationally and you're thinking provincially. And, uh, and I really, uh, I'm in awe of that ability. Um, it's as simple in our community as donating to the local cancer foundation. And if you make a donation to your local cancer foundation, your cancer center, and you say, you know, this is for cancer research, mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, you know, what is sort of donated here stays here. Um, and so, you know, I love multiple organizations, Canadian Cancer Society, all of these things are amazing and they do great work across the province. But when patients in my communities ask me this question, the answer is donate to your local foundation. Um, and so our Cancer Center Foundation uh, uh, actually gave us $50,000 to start this craft project. And the, the only reason we're, we're opening this is to put more patients on uh, cancer clinical trials. And so they, they gave this $50,000 as a startup um, to, to help us answer this question. And um, it was the Health Sciences North Sudbury Foundation that did so knowing that our goal would be to open a clinical trial in a community that wasn't even Sudbury. Uh, but small things like that, the foundations do incredibly good work. They help uh, local researchers open clinical trials where they live. If I could just add to that uh, briefly, Dr. Petrie. Yes, um, every uh, hospital, especially the larger ones, have foundations. Uh, these are hugely beneficial as, as far as you know, having uh, research and clinical trials at their facility. But at the same time, the national um, organizations like the Canadian Cancer Society, um, much of the funding that the Canadian uh, Cancer Trials Group gets is from the Canadian Cancer Society. Um, there are national organizations uh, for specific cancer types, like in, in, in myeloma, Myeloma Canada does a lot of fundraising. Um, that, um, so the combination of local uh, and national fundraising, um, you know, if you're thinking of a cause to contribute to, please consider, you know, that donating to uh, a cause that's going to fund research in, in your local communities and across Canada. David, excellent point. Um, if, if the um, Canadian Cancer Society and CCTG didn't exist, the ability to open clinical trials in uh, Sudbury would, would not exist. So the framework and the development of trials and the dissemination of trials and the monitoring of trials is of critical importance nationally. And uh, that's an excellent point. And, and everybody said all the right things already, which I completely agree with. I think the other thing we should do as a community, though, is, is reach out to our MPs and say, cancer is important for us. This is mm -hmm. a big deal. We need to have people. We need the government to pay attention to that. 
government should have to be involved in supporting things like clinical trials, uh, biomanufacturing for clinical trials, these sorts of things, I think are really important. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, the cost of these immunotherapies do come out very high at the beginning. CAR T therapy being one of these is outrageously expensive. Uh, but we send people south of the border at about a million dollars a piece to, to get treated. So if our mechanics decide, let's stop doing that, let's do it ourselves. And we're now doing it ourselves, doing what we call point of care manufacturing at individual hospitals to produce CAR T therapy. It seems to be there's a special on CTV about one of the, our patients who's doing extremely well. And I, I think that there's a, a, a will in Canada to not make a billion dollars, not to become billionaires, but actually do something good for the, com the country. And we're manufacturing CAR T therapy now for about a fifth of the price that you have to pay for the commercial product. So I think lots of us want to get behind this and say, look, at, we want to do the thing that's right for Canadians uh, and for Canadian patients. And we want our government to do what's right for us too. And, and that is to support research and, and because I think that's critical for all of us, not even just for cancer, for heart disease, for many other kinds of things that impact our, our lives on a daily basis. So that would be my suggestion to all of you is to write a letter to your MP and say, hey, this is really important to us, so do something about it. Yep. And, and John, particularly for cancer, uh, almost half of Canadians alive today will have cancer sometime in their lifetime. Uh, a, a quarter of us will die from it. Uh, so cancer impacts essentially every family in Canada. And that message we should get across to our uh, government representatives um, to show the importance of funding cancer and innovative therapies, like you mentioned, uh, where you can uh, produce these immunotherapies at uh, much lower cost. Thank you so very much, David, John, Louise, Lacey, Kelvin, uh, and everybody who, who has attended this session. On behalf of BioCanRx, this was absolutely outstanding. And I would like to thank our moderators and our panelists um, who, who are shown here uh, for this incredible and insightful uh, discussion that we had today. I would also like to take this opportunity once again to thank uh, our sponsor Merck, uh, without whose support this kind of, of activity, uh, and in addition, our summit for cancer immunotherapy uh, could not take place. As a reminder to everyone who attended the session today, uh, we have posted the link to the survey in the chat. You'll also be receiving an, an email with this link, and we would invite you to please uh, fill out the survey. These are uh, sets of data that we pay very, very close attention to. And so please, if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, that would be greatly appreciated. And finally, uh, in the new year, we will be restarting our summit speaker series uh, once again, and this will provide an opportunity to hear about that great research that we've been speaking about today uh, that's taking place across Canada and the development of novel immunotherapies, of novel clinical trials that are taking place, and that include um, a patient representative in addition to an explanation on the science in, in really accessible terms terms in addition to hearing from scientists. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about that, please visit biocanorex.com. Uh, and if, in, if you wish to do so, please sign up for our newsletter as well. I'd like to extend a very sincere thanks to everybody across the country who joined us today. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs>